going to ask all the kids to come on up this morning. Good morning. Who brought you to church this morning? Who brought you to church? No, who brought you to church? You were right. Who brought you to church? Yeah, your parents brought you to church. Who brought you to church? You came with your friend, right? All right. Who brought you to church, Sadie? Your mom and dad brought you to church. Brenda, who brought you to church? Man. So somebody brought you to church this morning, right? Now, could you come if they didn't bring you? Be hard. I mean, you have to get on that bike pretty early. I doubt they would let you be able to do that. Tell you what, would you like for your parents to have some gummies this morning if you knew they were going to come back and give them to you later? Right? All right. So I want you to go and I want you to bring your parents up here. Go back and bring who brought you to church up here. All right. Need to do it quickly. Bring who brought you to church up here. Parents, quit rolling your eyes. You have to get out of that seat. You want them to learn something. I want you to bring who brought you to church this morning. Bring them up here to me. Bring them up here. Let's go. Bring them. Bring them. Bring them. Bring them. Now. Now. Ron Davis. Come here, please. Ron, when you were young and, and you know that God wanted you to come to him, how'd you get to church? Who brought you? Church bus. Church bus brought Ron to church. Ron came to church and came to salvation knowledge and now he's back here. But do you know that somebody always has to bring somebody? It's not always the parents. It's not always the the person, the friend that brings this. It could be anybody. Do you know that your job is to bring people to Jesus? And it's Jesus' job to bring people to God. But do you realize, now how many people know that it's Jesus who brings us to God? Like, I can't bring you. I can't bring you to God. What I do is bring you into the presence of of Jesus, and then Jesus brings you to God. But somebody has to bring you, don't they? Parents. Now, you came up here, and I know you wanted these gummies, right? (laughs) Who brought you to church? Jason, who brought you to church? Who brought you to God? Isn't that amazing? They brought you. And then you accepted who? You accepted Jesus? Now, was there any other way for you to get to God? So you mean to tell me that you couldn't just decide one day that you heard something and come to God because you did good works, Jason? No. No. You had to come through who? Jesus. Jesus. Is he the only one that can bring you to God? Well, then who brought you to Jesus? My parents. Who brought your parents to Jesus? Who brought you to Jesus, Candy? Isn't that amazing? Don't we forget that? You realize we forget it. This isn't just to them. You see, but it can stop at them. If you don't bring anybody to Jesus, then I can't do this children's sermon in 10 years, in 15 years. You know why people quit coming to Jesus? Because people quit bringing people to Jesus. Parents, thank you for bringing your kids. Now, did you, you say, oh, I brought him to church. I brought her to church. You brought her into the presence of God today. You know that Jesus is going to be able to be moving and working in this room, right? Is there a better place to bring them? Parents, thank you for bringing them to Jesus today. If they're not old enough yet, Understand, if you keep bringing them to Jesus, he'll keep speaking, and one day he'll bring them to God. Amen? Amen. Parents, I'm going to give you some gummies. (laughs) 
<laughs> Hold on, kids. Now, I only have a couple of packs of the ones you like, but I got a whole box of these other ones, right? But and I know you like these too. Should I give the parents this kind or this kind? <laughs> parents, they hadn't learned that yet, right? It's, you'll be working on that unselfish thing for a long time. Help me out, parents. I can't. Help me out. I can only move back so far. Pass that to the parents. Thank you. All the parents have one. All the parents have one. Now, my little children, come up here and get you one. Guess what we're going to do before, what we always do before we get these? What we always do? Let's pray together, okay? Father God, I love you so much, and I love these babies. I love these children. I thank you, God, so much, so much for orchestrating their lives where somebody is bringing them to you. I thank you, Lord, for all the resources. Lord, we talk about, Lord, even back when we see an adult that was brought by somebody that had a desire to bring children to church on a bus, Lord, we see that they have to be brought to you. Thank you, God, for putting people in place that bring people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Parents, I don't know if you caught the subliminal in that uh, children's sermon, but down to one box of gummies. So, if by way of knowing that, the Holy Spirit leads it on your heart to be able to go and purchase something so that we can keep giving examples that are motivated in ways that where these children pick up on it. If not, I understand that, but I'm just putting it out there. All right. How many people have your Bible today? If you have your Bible, stand up and raise it above your head. Beautiful. You may be seated. There will be several places in Scripture today, but just so that you can camp at a couple of places and know that we'll, we'll be there, I want you to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. You can hold a place there. Soon we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 3, and then Hebrews chapter 7. Now you don't have to find all of them at one time, but that's where we'll be the rest of the places. You can write on your notes or turn there if you have time, but those three places will suffice. And in saying that, I'm not even going to start there. I want to start there and walk you through a story. I love the stories of the Bible. They all have a reason. They all have a purpose. And I don't know if you remember, but back as the, the Gospel of Matthew starts in chapter 4, we see that Jesus was, was baptized, and we saw that in Matthew 3, and after he was finished being baptized, anybody know who baptized Jesus? John the, Baptist. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And then we see in Matthew 4, his temptation. The devil tried to tempt him, and after that, just walking you through, after that, Jesus began to preach. And there's a, a verse right about midways in the fourth chapter of Matthew, verse 17, that says, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what was Jesus' message in one word? Somebody tell me. Repent. So he was saying that you need to change your mind, change the way you're thinking, because understand, before this, people were coming to God by just obeying the law. They were coming to God through their works of obedience to the law, and Jesus was saying, repent, you have to change that. Now, not everybody wanted to change that. 
God had you come to him in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, by the adherence of the law and by sacrifice. And so, with that being said, Jesus was preaching a new message, and his message was to repent. Why? It's imperative. The kingdom of God is at hand. You can be in the kingdom of God right now. You can be here right now. It's right now. Not next week. Not when you're older. Right now. Jesus was preaching repentance. He was telling people the way to come to God. He was actually trying to bring people to God by preaching the truth. Do you know that Jesus preached the truth? Amen. But that's the way he brought people to God, by telling them the truth. Now, when you get to verses 18 through 20 in Matthew, you see that Jesus, well, Jesus began to call his disciples to follow him. And you might know this. It's, it's a story that a lot of people know he talks to, to Andrew and Peter, and he tells them that he'll make them fishers of men. Does anybody remember that story? Yeah. Follow me and I will make you what? Fishers. fishers of men. Were they fishers of fish? Yeah. How good does this work, knowing we had fishing permissions yesterday, right? <laughs> so let me explain what happened. You, you get your bait, and you go out and put effort, and you throw it into the pond... And you try to catch what? Fish. Now the fish are in the pond. What are you trying to do with the fish? Bring them where? Bring them in. Bring them in. You're trying to bring them in. So it takes effort and you have to go out and put that effort. There were some people that didn't come to fish. They were people that came to watch. And I talked to those people because they were just out there to enjoy the day. They didn't bring any bait. They didn't drink, bring a pole. They just sat there and enjoyed it and seemed to have a wonderful time. But they didn't come to fish, so they didn't bring any fish in, but they didn't expect to bring any fish in. They were there just the same. Now, Jesus told Peter that he was going to make them fishers of men, which means that he was going to let them be able to go out and bring men in. Remember that. Because Peter became a fisher of men. You realize that Peter preached the message when Jesus ascended back into heaven, if you read Acts chapter 2, Peter preached the message that was phenomenal. This Peter, he stood up and guess what message he preached? If you want to read it sometimes, read Acts 2 because the message that Peter preached was repent and be baptized. Why? Well, it's like he heard Jesus preach. The kingdom of God is at hand. What happened? 3,000 people were saved. Amen. The church began. The Bible says, and there were that day added unto them 3,000 souls, and they were baptized, and they began to steadfastly, that means every day consistently, be able to learn the apostles' doctrine. That means they came in, they were discipled, they broke bread together, they fellowshiped together, they met house to house, and they prayed together, and they praised God together. And the church began, and you're a product of that movement today, because Peter preached that message. He brought those 3,000 people back to Jesus. He immediately became a fisher of men because those people were hearing a new message. What was Peter preaching? Was Peter preaching, you need to come to God by the way you've always come to God? No, he had a new message. You need to come to God by Jesus Christ. And if you read that message, he'll say, this same Jesus Christ is the one that God sent, the one that he spent. You say, well, so we need to throw the Old Testament away. Oh, no. That's the mind of God. God spent his time in the Old Testament telling you he is coming. So we need to understand that before Jesus called Peter to follow him as a disciple, that someone else actually had to call Peter. So in John 1, we read this. And I want you to look at the progression of who brought who. We begin in verses 26, and I'll try to read as quickly as I can. And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who cometh after me, who is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it. I am not worthy to unloose. Who is John the Baptist talking about? These things were done in Beth Arbor, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, 
Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Who's the only one that can take away the sin of the world? Did John point him out? And he called him what? The Lamb. Understand, Old Testament wise, it took the blood of the Lamb to forgive sins. And he would say, this is, and if you look at translation, the Lamb. It's imperative, the Lamb. No more lambs, the Lamb. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and had a boat upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent baptized with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Right. Now listen, verse 35. Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, do you know that John had disciples? John had people that followed him as he preached. Two of his disciples, now interesting here, it says, two of his disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, what seek you? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and he abode with them that day for it was about the 10th hour, meaning about four o'clock. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew was a disciple of John. Somebody told Andrew that John was preaching in the wilderness and Andrew went and he was following John. John was going from place to place so Andrew came and followed John. But when John identified the lamb, John brought Andrew to Jesus. And when Andrew saw Jesus, he stopped following John and started following who? And he, he followed Jesus, and then Jesus turned around and said, what do you want? You're following me. I'm being trailed. And they said, hey, where are you staying? We want to come there. He said, come and see. You know what that means? Come and feel. Come and experience. Come and see. Understand, you can't experience until you come and see. This is big. One of the two which heard John speak was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Simon Peter had not even come into the story yet. He just identified him as Simon Peter's brother. Oh, Andrew, he never gets, he's Simon Peter's brother, right? The angel always, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just Mike's wife, right? I hear her say that all the time, I'm Mike's wife. That's how I get introduced. I don't have a name, I'm Mike's wife. Bless her heart, right? Bless Andrew's heart. Andrew's just Simon Peter's brother. This is important. It says, He first, this is Andrew, He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. Was Andrew excited when he went to Peter? We have found him. We have found him. This is the Messiah that we've learned about from the Old Testament. We found him. We found him. He was excited. But look at the next verse. He, he wasn't just excited. He was giving his testimony. Verse 42, it says, and he brought him to who? Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. Tell the person beside of you what Andrew did with Peter. What did he do? He brought him to Jesus. Did this take effort? Yes. Andrew became a fisher before Peter ever thought about being a fisher. He went and brought him in. And who did he bring him to? Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is stone. The day following, Jesus would go into Galilee and findeth Philip. And he saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter. So here's the link. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now listen. You want to read about that sometime, you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 through 19, and you'll see that Jesus didn't just come on the pages of Scripture when the, when the, the New Testament started. 
the prophet spoke about him, the scripture spoke about him, and these people that were trying to find God, well, they knew the Messiah was coming, so when they find Jesus, they say, we can get to God. Amen. All right? So this Philip found Jesus because he was in the city of Andrew and Peter. Once Philip found Jesus, he went to his friend Nathaniel, and he said, hey, I found the Messiah. It's him. There's no mistaking. Was Philip excited? Now understand, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, these are the disciples that ended up following Jesus now. So he tells Nathaniel, but Nathaniel was skeptical. If you read on down, you're going to see that Nathaniel, well, Nathaniel, he was from a town that didn't care too much for the town of Nazareth. And so when he said, we found Jesus, he's from Nazareth, and Nathaniel says, well, what good thing could come out of Nazareth? Here's what we forget. Jesus knew Nathaniel was coming. He just needed somebody to bring him. Philip was the one that brought him. It says, Nathanael, he said unto him, we found, the, we found of him Moses and the prophets did write. Verse 46, Nathanael said unto him, can there be any good thing that comes out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, listen, Philip did not give him the five point sermon on why Jesus was there. He didn't try to convince him. He didn't debate him. He didn't sit down and give him a dissertation. Philip said, come and see. That's how he brought Nathaniel to Jesus. He didn't say, listen, now I want to I uh, refute that point and I want to give you this five point thing. And I listened to a blog last week that said this or that said this. No. He said, I found him. Come and see. Come and experience what I've done. Just come. Just come and be in his presence. Just come and feel him. Just come and listen to this man speak. Come and feel him. That see is not just with the eyes. In translation, we have the word see. It means come and experience. Come and feel. Come and experience. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, of whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me, Jesus? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, <laughs> when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Amen. You know what Jesus was doing? He was displaying his supernatural power before Nathanael ever got to him. He said, son, before you came looking for me, I saw you. And he relayed to him an experience that he saw him that evidently nobody knew Nathanael was under that fig tree when he had this, this event happen in his life, but Jesus knew he was there. And when Jesus said that, Nathanael immediately knew, listen, nobody in the world knows that. It had, has to be you. Amen. You know that when you bring somebody into Jesus' presence, he will reveal his supernatural power to them. Amen. When you're in the presence of Jesus, all kind of things can happen. The story goes on, and Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, now listen, this Nathaniel that didn't know if anything good came out of Nazareth made a proclamation here. He said, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Amen. <clears throat> Nathaniel went on to tell people, you say, why are we going through all this? I'm going through this to be able to let you know that as we begin to see each one of these people from Andrew all the way to the 3,000 that were saved when Peter preached, that were brought to Jesus by someone else and understand that each one brought somebody else to Jesus and the New Testament church started and you have the example of Philip bringing Nathaniel, and you're showing all these people from John the Baptist that brought Andrew, from Andrew that brought Peter, from Peter uh, and Andrew that were in the city that went Philip, and then Philip brought Nathaniel, and you, no telling who else got brought. We know 3,000 people were brought, and then it said they got spread out, and that's how you got here today. Understand, it all started by somebody bringing somebody. And listen, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul came to salvation knowledge because of the church movement that started that he was persecuting that started with Peter preaching a message that started with Andrew bringing him to him which started with John the Baptist bringing Andrew. Now, that's a lot to keep up with who's bringing who. But I want to talk to you today about who's bringing who. Tell the person beside of you who's bringing who. Who's bringing who. Who's bringing who? 
And if we can leave here today knowing who's bringing who, you'll find your place. All right? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I want us to start by learning the first truth. Let's start by learning who brings us to God. 1 Peter chapter 3. Listen as Peter writes, verses 12 through 18. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of him that is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. And I want to stop at this verse for a second because basically this is the same Peter that was brought by Andrew that was brought by John the Baptist. This is old Peter, late in his life. And he's telling us, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set him apart in your, in your heart and do not be ashamed to testify of him to whoever asks you. Why? Because this same Peter had seen thousands of people be brought to Jesus by the word of testimony. When someone says, what happened to you? Do you know what you say? Come and see. I'm going to take you to the place it happened. I'm going to take you to the presence of where it happened. And that's basically what Peter is describing here. Set apart the Lord God in your heart. Be ready to give an answer for the reason that you have that hope. Well, first thing, would anybody know you have that hope by the way that you're acting? Do they see a joyful spirit with you knowing that you have met Jesus, you've been brought to God? Well, they're not going to see a reason for your hope if you're always giving a hopeless conversation. But he's saying, if you're out there and you're representing Jesus, then be ready to give an answer. Even if you're persecuted, even if they talk bad about you where you work, even if your family talks bad about you, even if your family says, I can't believe that you're doing this and why are we doing this way? Be ready to give an answer. Why? Because that's the way you're bringing somebody. Now, he goes on to say in verse 16, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, meaning the way you live for Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so than to suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Now listen to verse 18, because it lets us know this first truth. What is the first truth? Who brings us to God? So who brings us to God? You tell me. Now listen, somebody would just have to take your word or my word. But we don't have to because we've got his word. Listen to what Peter says in this declarative statement. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might, underline this, why did he do all this? Somebody tell me these four words, that he might what? Bring us to God. Can it be any more clear? Why did he suffer for you? So that he could what? So that he could bring you to God. Is there another reason so that you could go out and you could be this successful person in life and you could, no, he suffered for you so that he could bring you to God. Amen. It's that simple. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, meaning brought alive by the Spirit. So the first truth that I want you to write down today is that Jesus it is Jesus that brings us to God. Now the scripture explains this truth. But we need to understand that Jesus was the only man who never sinned. Anybody believe that? Amen. That's why this scripture calls him the just. Now have you sinned? Yes. We're the unjust. The just for the unjust. If you look at the scripture you see that he's the only one who could meet the requirement of sacrifice that God set forth in the old covenant. The old covenant was to bring the perfect lamb, but you need to understand something. A lamb couldn't keep dying for our sins as, as the book of Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats. Yes, it was fine for temporary forgiveness, but you had to keep coming back and offering this same sacrifice. This one lamb died once and for all to become the sacrifice. Why this lamb? 
Why Jesus? Because it had to be a man. It had to be someone who's experienced the temptation that you've experienced. That's the difference between Jesus, the Son of God, and God. God is holy. God is righteous. But understand, Jesus walked in the same footsteps that you and I walked. So not only like we talked about Wednesday night, he's the judge of our sin because he can stand in front of God and say, listen, I know they can be tempted that way. God can never even be tempted with sin. Jesus walked as flesh and blood man. He can speak for us. But Jesus did not sin. So Jesus is the only one that could be that sacrifice. Jesus suffered and died for our sins. Why? Answers here that he might bring us to God. Jesus was sinless and just. We are sinful and unjust. Why did he refuse to give in to temptation? The one reason that Jesus refused to give in to temptation, and this blows my mind. You say, why did he? Because he loves me. Right. He loves me. And how did he prove that? He lived a sinless life so that he could do what? Bring me to God. If Jesus would have ever given in to one of those sins, and I've told you before, it is a big, big deal that Jesus, through that whole Passion Week, was mocked and spit on and beaten and persecuted and died. I'm not minimizing that. I will tell you this, if I had to die for one of my family members, and you had to die for one of your family members, you would probably say, yes, I would die for them, right? But Jesus was not just a martyr for the cause. Jesus didn't just die. He lived every day refusing to sin so that he could bring us to God. Now, if you said, Pastor Mike, for this next week, you're going to have to live every day with never sinning or giving in to sin in your mind to save one of your children. Oh, no. Oh, I'd be willing to die. But Jesus was willing to live for us. That's big. Every day, every minute of his life. And why? One reason, so that he could what? Tell me all together. So that he could bring us to God. Now, we need to understand this truth that it's Jesus. And only Jesus. The scripture tells us even on the cross in Mark 15, verse 17 and 18, the Bible says, and Jesus cried and gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Remember that scripture? What's the significance of that? Understand something. The veil of the temple of God was the barrier between man coming into the presence of God. He's speaking about the actual temple that was in Jerusalem. And that's where God had commanded men to come and worship him through sacrifice. They would make their way there. But understand, the way that the, the temple was designed, all the way back to when the specifics were given to, to Solomon, and before that, when the tabernacle, when the, 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 the mobile tent of the meeting in Moses' day, it was designed to where in the middle of the temple was called the most holy place, or the holiest of holies. And in this most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And you couldn't just stroll into this Ark of the Covenant. You couldn't come into here. You, you, you had no way of coming. There was a curtain between it, and only the great high priest could enter into this place. Not even all the other priest it was the holiest of holies the curtain separated praise God when Jesus Christ cried and gave up the ghost God himself gave a physical sign in Jerusalem that actually happened the veil of the temple what surrounded people from coming into the presence of God was ripped from top to bottom with the hands of God Amen. not from bottom to top you know where God is right from top to bottom. This was not a little tent like you get changed in. This was not a little curtain like you get changed in. You're talking about, go back and study, and we don't have time to go into it, but study the details of the temple. You'll see how big this curtain was and what it was made out of. God ripped it. Why did he rip it? Because Jesus was signifying, by my death, I am able to bring you into the presence of God Almighty. That was the sign, the physical sign. His job was to bring us into his presence. Now, he brings us into his presence when we accept him as our Savior. Then he continues to bring us into his presence when we go to him in prayer. And if we sin against him, he continues to bring us back into pre his presence because he's our advocate with the Father. Jesus' whole job is to bring us into the presence of God. Hey, just a little nugget for you. 
Hebrews 7. Listen to verses 22 through 28. The Bible says, I'll let you turn. Sorry, I get rolling. I'm excited. Are you excited about it? There's no, nobody when you leave here today can make you a promise like you're going to hear is promised for you. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and, the, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, talking about Jesus, became because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he liveth, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Jesus became the great high priest, but not the great high priest that we went to a funeral for, the great high priest that lives forever. He said there were many priests because they kept dying, but this one liveth forever. Glory to God. Verse 24, 25 of Hebrews 7 says, He is able also to save them to the uttermost. That means save them completely, not temporary, but completely, that come unto God by him. So Jesus became and still is the only high priest that came into the presence of God and brings us into the presence of God. He came into this world and lived a sinless life and died a sacrificial death so that he could bring us into the presence of God. And if we accept by belief that Jesus died for our sins, if we use that sacrifice, the just for the unjust, and we ask him to forgive our sins and accept by belief that he can bring us into fellowship with God, then he'll give us eternal fellowship with God. He'll save us from the penalty of God. You say, do you know that's Jesus' purpose? Well, he continually told us. Luke 19, 10, that his purpose for coming to this earth was to save us. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save them which were lost. How does Jesus save you? People wonder sometimes about how he saves you and what he's saving you from. He's saving you from being separated from God. That's what you're saved from. Broken fellowship with God. Because that's what hell is. Hell is eternal broken fellowship with God. So I thought hell was a place of torment and flames. Yeah, that's because that's the way we paint it. Because we want people to be scared they're going to get burned up. Is hell a place of eternal flame? Yes. Is it a lake of fire? Yes. But guess what? The, the worst thing is you're eternally separated with no hope to ever get to God. That's what hell is. There's people that are living a living hell here because they're separated from God. When sin entered into this world in the Garden of Eden, understand man's fellowship with God was, was lost. Man used to have fellowship with God, but sin came into the world. Man was cast out of the presence of God, so the ability for man to come into the presence of God was lost because God could not have fellowship with sinful man. You see, it started back in Genesis. And the only way that man could come back into presence and the fellowship with God was to bring a sacrifice, right? A blood sacrifice. That was initiated when man's sin had to be covered and God had to kill an animal and take its skin. That was the first blood sacrifice. So you know, even in the progression of the story, as Abel and Cain brought a sacrifice, God said, make it a blood sacrifice. That's the only way to come into my presence. So they kept bringing blood sacrifices and they would bring them every year. And especially at the Passover and they would come every year. But praise God, Jesus came and said, hey, listen, I am, I am the sacrifice. You will need no more if you believe and trust in me. You say, is that Old Testament? No, that's today. It's Old Testament and it's today. The way for you to get to God, friend, is not by good works. It is not by, by you being able to do good things. It is not by you just saying, okay, listen, I came to church today. today the only way for you to get to God is through Jesus Christ. His purpose was to bring you to God. Remember our theme verse in 1 Peter 3.18. He suffered for your sins to bring you to God, being put to flesh in the death. 
You see, this is the distinct truth that Christianity is based on. We have to accept this truth in order for us to come to God and be saved from our sins and our lost condition. This distinct truth is that Jesus is the only one that can bring us to God. He's the only one that can bring us into fellowship with God. He's the only one that continually bring us into conversation with God. Because when we read in verse 25, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Today, he's still trying to bring you to God. He might have brought you in salvation, Christian, but he still wants to bring you into the presence of God. That's why you're praying in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus is not here, but he sent the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, which represents Jesus. And when you come in here today, you're bringing that Spirit in here with you today. And if th someone that's not in here today... That does not have the Holy Spirit because they're not saved. They've never accepted Jesus as their Savior. Maybe they, they grew up thinking, okay, I know there's a God, but they never came through who? And who has to bring you to God? Can you just walk up to God? Could those kids just walk into church this morning? No, somebody had to bring them, but then somebody had to bring them, but then somebody had to bring them. Who's bringing who? Well, we know the end of the story. The only one that can bring you to God is who? And he came to do that, right? Amen. So if he came to do that, and Jesus came to bring us to God, and we rest in that truth, are we good? You know, it seems to be that our mind, even as Christians, have begun to, to think that, okay, well, listen, I'm going to stand on this truth that Jesus is the only one that got me to God. You said, hold on, preacher. You're getting ready to preach something different? I am. I am. You see, Jesus continually brings us to God. But he can only bring you one time to be saved. He brings you to God and you ask him to forgive your sins. But understand, Jesus keeps bringing you to God, even in the way that John writes in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. John writes, my little children, these things I write unto you. Now listen to his first command, that you sin not. So he's telling you not to sin. But then he says, but if any man sin. So how many of you know not to sin? Now how many of you have come to God through Jesus Christ? You know beyond a shadow of a doubt there was a day you accepted God. Uh, you accepted God's salvation. You accepted Jesus as your Savior. You said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I want to use your blood to cover my sins. How, anybody in here that has come to God through Jesus? Right, right. And so you know once you do that, he doesn't want you to what? Sin. Now, how's that work for you? I write to you that you sin not, but listen, but, but if any man sin, now glory to God. Look what the verse says. He has an advocate, an advocate with the Father. You know what an advocate is? Somebody that speaks for you. Somebody that speaks for you, and then it names him. What's the Bible called advocate here? Jesus Christ, the righteous. That would be Jesus Christ, the just, speaking for who? The unjust. Now it goes further because if you look in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. But then listen to what it says. It names him again, the man Christ Jesus. He didn't just say Christ Jesus, the man Christ Why did he say the man Christ? Because your advocate, your mediator, was also a flesh and blood man. That's speaking on your behalf. So he's the only one that can bring your sin back to Jesus, Christian, after your sin. Jesus' job was for us to bring us into the presence of God. But we can get too comfortable with that. You say, well, I'm a strong Christian. I believe that, and that's what everything's based on. Well, we have to believe this truth. But here's what I want to share with you. This is what's on my heart. This is a little different. But I'm looking around, and I'm seeing a society that all of us Christians are complaining about. And I'm seeing us say, well, the whole world is thinking this way, and I see this, and I see this, and I see this. And then I look in churches today, and I see that, Lukewarm churches are growing by leaps and bounds because they're not preaching the gospel or they don't want to offend anybody, but churches that are preaching the word and got strong people in them, and just like us, we got strong people, and they're into the word, they're into the Bible. 
But we're not seeing people get saved like we should. Why? Get this. Because I want to identify it today. Even in our strong belief in the first truth, which is the only person that can bring someone to God, is Jesus. We're resting in that one truth and not carrying out the second truth. You say, what is the second truth? The second truth is Jesus brings people to God after people bring people to Jesus. If you stop bringing people into the presence of Jesus, then who's Jesus going to bring to God? You said, oh, well, Jesus, he'll find a way. Well, then why did he give us the Great Commission? Jesus will find a way. Then why did he tell us to, to go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in? What was he just talking? No. The reason we've stopped seeing church growth, the reason that we're not having a baptismal service every two months, the reason we're not seeing people get saved is because people quit bringing other, by, other people to church. Even us in our strong belief, listen, Jesus is going to save them. We sit here and we think, man, I hope somebody gets saved this week. I hope somebody comes to church and hears the word of God and gets saved. How many people wanted that today? Anybody want to come in here and see somebody get saved? Right. We're just hoping this mysterious person walks in here off the street. No, that person comes because you brought them. You brought them into the presence of God. You said, come and see what I've experienced. Now, if you're in a church where you're not experiencing something, and it's this church, leave. You don't need to be here. You need to go find a church that can minister to you. And then you need to pray for us if we're not there. Everybody should leave if this is not a Bible-believing church. But if it's a church that you experience Jesus in, your one thing is to say, come and see what I'm feeling. You say, well, I'm bringing them to church. I'm bringing them to Jesus. Understand the Bible tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. He tells us if we agree on anything when we come in here. Listen, Reggie, when you came in here, are you a saved man? You brought the Spirit of God in here with you. Mike, are you a saved man? Gail, are you a saved woman? The Spirit of God came in here with him. It's an agreement. I'm preaching the Word of God, which was written by the Spirit of God, revealing it to men. When the Word of God is preached and the Spirit of God is responding and the Spirit is full, the presence of Jesus Christ is in this room through the Holy Spirit. If you bring somebody into this presence... Guess what? They have a chance to get saved. It will always be up to them, but they can't come unless they're brought. Right now, every person in here that is saved, that got saved in church hearing the gospel or the message resonated to you, raise your hand. Look around. Rest the case. You say, well, I'm trying to lead these people to to Christ at work, and you should be. But you know what? Your mind's going right back to something else. You say, well, Jesus can take that. He could. I'm saying, I'm an advocate for, for witnessing at work, witnessing at school. Yeah, absolutely, but bring them into the presence of God sometimes. If you're coming in, bring them in. You know why we don't bring them sometimes? Because we're not bringing ourselves consistently enough. Hey, well, tell them to come, but that means we would have to be there. Listen, this crowd right here, if 25% of us brought somebody that we want to see get saved next week to church, I can almost guarantee you out of that 25%, we'd see somebody saved that you won't Amen. save. You say, why? Because you're such a good preacher. Absolutely not. Because the presence of God is in here. If the word is preached, it doesn't matter if I preach it or if somebody sits up here and, and just reads it. If the presence of God is here, the presence of God is here. Right. You see, we rest in the truth. That God can bring people to Jesus. And listen, that is a good truth. And listen, we're one of those people that say there's no other way to get to God. And we preach that a lot. But listen, here's what we don't do. We don't talk about how they get to Jesus. Who's bringing who? Well, listen, Peter didn't write that because Peter just happened to stumble upon Jesus. Peter wrote that because John the Baptist told Andrew and Andrew told, told Peter. And then Peter preached and then all these other people came and the church started. And that's why you're here today. Who's bringing who? Now, Christian, let me talk to you a second. When this life is over, and all these things that we have accumulated, 
our houses and our property and our money, our name. Do you know what you're judged on when you stand before God besides just the way you represented him? Who you brought with you. Jesus gave a commission before he left to go to heaven that said, all power has been given unto me. Power to what? Power to save. Amen. Read Matthew 28, those last verses sometimes, and you'll see what he said. All power has been given unto me. What do you mean been given unto me? Power to save. I sure wish this person would get saved. Wish on and want on. Have you brought them by your witness? Have you brought them by your testimony? Do they keep hearing you say, come and see, come and see, come and see? And I'm not talking about just bringing them to church, but that, that's a great avenue. I'm talking about letting them see him in you. But do you realize then he said the next thing? He said, go ye therefore. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Is that important? Yes, because if you flip the page of that gospel and go to the book of Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said this, but you shall receive power. Who gave him power? God gave him power. Power to what? Power to save. Guess what you were given power to do? Power to bring people to him for him to save. Amen. So how do you know? He says, you shall be given power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. I didn't have power to save somebody. I had power to witness of Jesus' saving power. Amen. You get that, right? So it's about me bringing somebody to Jesus so that he can bring them to God. That's my role. If I'm sanctifying the Lord God in my heart, like Peter is saying, then Jesus' purpose is to bring them to God. It will always be their choice. But God puts us in the equation. And if we rest too much on that one truth, then we're leaving it all up to Jesus to do. You say, well, Jesus can do it. He can do it, but his system always has used people to bring people to him. Or else, why does he need you? If that's the case, the best thing that can happen for us is as soon as we get saved, they took us out back and shot us. Then we just go to heaven. No. No. God needs to use us. Jesus continually told us, go out and make disciples. Go out and bring them in. Where does this start? Well, it starts as me as a husband and a father. My first priority is to bring my family to Jesus. Your first priority as a parent, a wife, a husband, is to make sure that you're bringing your marriage to Jesus, that you're bringing your family to Jesus. Listen, I remember back in the Old Testament, one of the declarative statements was Joshua. And Joshua said this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You know what Joshua said? Joshua said, I'm bringing my family to God. Amen. When I think about that person that had that desire to run that church bus so my brother could get saved and be here with me today, glory to God. You know what they were doing? They were bringing people to Jesus. You say, they brought him to church. He found Jesus at church because the, the presence of the Holy Ghost was there. Amen. When I think about my parents, I sat with them last night and I had to thank them for what? Bringing me to Jesus. My dad made a decision one day and walked into our house and said, I got saved. He said, from now on, we're going to a place where we hear about people getting saved so y'all can understand because we thought he had an accident at work when he said he got saved. We didn't know. But yet I already went through the class and had my papers. I was going to heaven. Not. He made a decision that says, we're going to do that. He made a decision to gather us around a table and read the word of God on a nightly basis. He made a decision that said, we're going to do this in our house and we're not going to do this. And we didn't like it. But he suffered even the persecution of his family. Why? 
because he just wanted to make sure that he was doing his job of bringing people to Jesus and my mom the same way. I've had the opportunity over the years to see hundreds and hundreds of people accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Maybe even a thousand praying with them. Why? Because somebody brought me to Jesus. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to bring people to Jesus. Don't think about me. What are you supposed to do? Bring people to Jesus. He'll save them. It'll always be up to them, but he'll save them. He has put you in the lives of people to bring them here. You say, I have tried and I have tried and I have tried. Listen, God's the one orchestrating their life. Something will hit their little life to where they'll remember that you wanted them to come. And when they run out of their option or their place to be, or they realize their life's so terrible, they can't have fun at this place they're being at besides it, then they'll say, what about that church you told me? There's people here that came here when your life was upside down because somebody told you, right? Isn't it amazing? His word never returns void. Your testimony won't return void. Bring somebody to Jesus so Jesus can bring somebody to God. You see, this whole life as a Christian is about who's bringing who. But understand, all you have to do is bring them to Jesus. Every Sunday school teacher that's going up there to teach, every nursery worker, every person that's singing in the choir to glorify God so the presence of God would get full in here, every person that's serving, making sure that the place is clean or that this is in order or something to make it where somebody can come into, you're bringing people to Jesus. Don't just rest in the fact that Jesus is doing all the work. He gives us something to do. Do you want to see revival in this church? I love you, but we were, not, we were not intended to stay status quo. You should be able to look every month, every year, and say, hey, listen, here's this person's story the way they came. Here's this person's story the way they came. You know why? Because somebody's bringing them. You should be able to look in your life and see these people you're praying for. We sit sometimes and just pray for God to just mysteriously do something. God, please do it. Listen, he turns back around to us and say, hey, listen, I gave you this opportunity to do your part to bring them here. And not necessarily to church, but bring them into my presence, bring them into the witness. Who brought you to Jesus? Think about it. Should it stop with you? Then who are you bringing? Who's bringing who? Well, Jesus will do his part. I think it's our part that's lacking. God said he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to. But Jesus says we have a part in that. Today, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, Jesus Christ will bring you to God. He came and lived and died so that he could bring you to God. He's the only sacrifice. Listen, if you're here today and you're just a church person, and you're saying, I'm trying to be a good person. Listen, if you don't know that you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, please come today. Please come today. Jesus has spoken to you today. You said you spoke. Listen, I'm speaking for Jesus. I'm trying to bring you to him. It's my job. Not my job. They pay me for my job as somebody that got brought to Jesus. It's your job too. I'll pray with you. You can leave here today knowing you can be a child of God and enjoy the presence of God because Jesus will bring you there. And Christian today, if you have, think right now. What can I be doing to bring somebody to God? Bring that name. Bring those people down. Get on the altar and pray for them and then ask God to open their hearts so that you can bring them into the presence of God. Let's get serious about this. We're resting in God's promise of knowing Jesus did all that. He gave us a job to do down here too. You'll start seeing revival. You'll start seeing life change. You'll start seeing a, an exciting spirit. Amen. Amen. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for calling us, Lord, to this point to where we can see so clearly what you want us to be able to see. I just have to praise you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. And Jesus, I praise you, praise you for bringing me to the Father. 
unworthy as I am. Lord, my Christian brothers and sisters here, God, I, I know sometimes we rest in your power, knowing that you told us we would receive power. God, give us, Lord, a conviction to use it. Give us, Lord, an enthusiastic spirit to use it, Lord. Let us be able to go out and compel others to come to you like you command. Lord, give us opportunities to bring people to you. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here, someone listening that's never accepted your son, Jesus, God, I pray they would come today so that Jesus can bring them to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? We're going to sing page 435.